It was a Stanford professor of geology, Cy Muller, a.k.a. Mr Yosemite, who came up with the term permafrost, reasoning the expression permanently frozen ground is too long and cumbersome. The only problem, nearly 70 years on from its coinage, is that a lot of permafrost isn't permanently permanent. A comment paper in today's Nature brings together evidence that huge areas of frozen ground are now thawing faster than previously thought, releasing vast quantities of carbon and, even more significantly, methane. Enough, it says, to have over double the impact on our climate as all global deforestation. This increase in atmospheric methane, its likely effects and how to counter them, are also being debated today at a methane hack meeting at the Geological Society of London. And just before we went on air, I spoke to one of its participants, Ewan Nisbet, Professor of Earth Sciences at Royal Holloway University of London, and we were joined on the line from Gainesville by the Nature Paper's lead author, Professor Ted Shaw from the Department of Biology at Florida University. And I asked Ted whether, having been used to problems due to decreasing sea ice in the Arctic, he was now trying to get us to focus on problems due to thawing land also bordering the Arctic. That's right. We're talking about permafrost on ground, which is the frozen land underlying land ecosystems. And the potential here is that the carbon in this permafrost can decompose and become greenhouse gases when they enter the atmosphere. And can you just give us an idea what this sort of terrain looks like? Well, tundra terrain varies from rolling hills to mountains and lowland landscapes. It's quite green in the summertime, um, but then quite cold and frozen in the winter. Interesting thing about the north is you can be up there in a summer day and it might be 60 degrees Fahrenheit, sunny day. But if you dig down into the soil, you'll find five or ten inches down there ground ice. The ground is still frozen from the cold winter. Now, the very fact that you've described what it's like up there on a summer's day implies that you're definitely not doing this all by remote monitoring. You are up there getting the measurements directly. Yes, my personal research takes me to Alaska where we measure in the field, so on the ground measurements of plants and soils and carbon cycling. And you just do, you do this by, by a whole series of tests in a whole series of places or do you just keep going back to one site? Well, this type of research is done at sites across the Arctic. My personal research site has a focus in the middle of Alaska um, mm. where I study these processes. You and Nisbet, I've more than once seen television documentaries where they show how it might be a bit of frozen ground or even a frozen lake. They show how it's possible to set fire to it because of all the methane bubbling up as things thaw. Is, is it hard for us to get our heads around just how much gas is potentially there because of as permafrost thaws? Potentially, there's a tremendous amount. In practice, whether it comes out is a very interesting question. We're actually measuring um, air samples in, in Spitsbergen, and at the moment, the methane we see comes from wetlands. There's a huge amount of carbon in the soil there, and if you warm it up, you, you get um, methanogenic. The, these are microbial production of methane, and sometimes that gets eaten by methanotrophs, which are bacteria that actually eat the methane, um, but sometimes it actually gets out to the air, and if, if it accumulates for some reason or other, for instance in a lake, you can, under the ice, sometimes get methane coming, popping out. So as you've already indicated, it's a complex cycle. If you've got enough what, methanotrophs, did you say, eating... They're the eaters, yeah. Yes, I mean, obviously, if you get enough of those, then you wouldn't have so much of a yeah. problem. It's the balance between what's in the ground, what's coming out of the ground, what's, what's being released through bacterial activity, and what's being gobbled up by and other bacterial how activity. how much carbon is there, and also there's methane coming up from deep down from geological sources. I mean, some of the world's biggest gas fields are, are in the high Arctic, and... A good deal of Europe gets its heat and its light and its power, Germany, from Russian gas, which comes from the Ob River estuary in, in the Arctic. So the Arctic is pretty important in the world's methane equation. It's also pretty important in the world's energy. It's, it's an important area. This isn't, you're not already hinting at a potential solution to the problems here, is if we can somehow release, release the methane, stop it getting into the atmosphere and use it as an energy source, isn't that a, a crisis turned into uh, well, an opportunity? Well, if there's a big enough gas field, yes, um, it, it, it displaces coal, so that's, that's probably a good thing. But much of this is fairly small-scale stuff, and if you're lucky, it gets eaten by the methanotrophs. But uh, if you warm the Arctic, you're going to get more gas out. And, and the methanotrophs, of course, pr produce CO2. They convert the carbon to CO2, which is what this paper is, is pointing out, that there's all sorts of risks there if you warm the place. Yes, I mean, Ted, one of these statistics from, from, from your paper that does sound remarkable is this idea that we could get to a situation where the, the thawing permafrost could have twice the impact on the climate as all global deforestation. 